This is episode 83 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he didn't know what the show notes page was. So I kind of figured that maybe some people listening to this don't know. Well, here's what it is. Every time I do a new interview, I create a show notes page on my website at thevarietyartist.com. It has links to everything we talk about. It sometimes has pictures or video or whatever it is that comes up. It also has links to my guest websites and social media channels. It even has a place where you can sign up to get my own personal perspective on each and every interview. Make sure to go there right after this interview and check it out. All right, let's talk about my guest. I'll ruin the surprise. It's successful family entertainer, Ken Scott. When listening to this interview, I realize why Ken is so successful. Yes, he's very good at his craft. Yes, he knows his audience. Yes, he loves what he does. But more than that, he's a really nice guy. People like to work with him. Conventions like having him and clients want to bring him back. Listen to this and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Have fun with the show. Fun fact number 203. When John was a teenager, he was a national ranked swimmer in three different events. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today is a four-time winner of the Greater Atlanta Magician of the Year Award. He's performed five times at the White House. He's appeared on ABC's America's Funniest Home Videos. He travels around the world teaching other entertainers his original ideas and routines. I even use some myself. Variety artist, I give you spectacular magician and all-around good guy, Ken Scott. Yay, the crowd goes wild. <laughs> How's it going, Ken? What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing really good, really good. This is good to talk to you. You too. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for joining me today. You, you know when we first met? I do, as a matter of fact. It was when I think you were hanging out with Robert Baxter, right? I was. Yeah, I was there doing the Magic Castle. And this had to be over 10 years ago. Uh, was it Sunset right there in front of the Magic Shop, wasn't it? Yep, in front of Hollywood Magic, was it, which is no longer there anymore. Right. And you were there and it was, a, I'm like, this is, this is where you want to live. All the magicians hang out right here. Yeah, I think is, you had all your animals in the back of your van or something. You were going to a show. I did. I was either on the way to a show or from a show. Yeah, I had my animals in the back and I yeah. like to chill and snake and all those things. And I want to know, I want to, say, I want to get to know that guy. You can tell when, when, there, when there's guys a worker or not. I said, he's a worker. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> when I met you, it was obviously Ken Scott was the name. Yeah. I noticed on your Facebook, though, that Ken Scott is not your entire name. Yeah, you know, Facebook won't let you... Do a fake name, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, my, my real name is Ken Scott Weisenbaker. How did you come up with Ken Scott then? Well, Scott is my middle name. Okay. Uh, but I, I, the funny story is that, you know, as I grew up, you know, I, I, my, my parents divorced and I remember my mom would pay for my baseball. So back when I was a kid playing baseball, all the other kids had their last name on their jersey. And with Weisenbaker, it was, she's like, you're going to be Ken because Weisenbaker is going to be 75 cents a letter. So I was Ken back when I was playing ball, but then when I got to be a teenager, I worked for Daytona Magic in the summer months, and I would travel on the road with them going to conventions, and we were at a convention, I think in Nashville for the IBM, and I remember Harry Allen saying, I was getting a badge made, he goes, what is your, what's your, what's your last name? Or he goes, what's your middle name? I go, Ken Scott. He goes, are right, you going to be Ken Scott? That's where the Ken Scott started when I was like 13 years old, because uh, he says, you don't want to go by Weisenbaker. No one's ever going to remember that or say it right. So that's where it started was when I was like 13. I became Ken Scott at an IBM convention. So Yeah, and Ken Scott's just way easier to put on banners and things and advertising things. And it's funny because kids don't call me Ken. They don't call it or Mr. Scott. It's always Ken Scott. That's how it, it's oh. just Ken Scott. Ken Scott. <laughs> you know, when I, when I first knew you and knew of you, I used to always say that too. I used to think, yeah, it's, oh, Ken Scott, Ken Scott, Scott Ken Scott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the two first names, I say it. That's right. <laughs> now, for people who have not seen you perform, what, what type of venues do you perform in or what do you do? Yeah, so I would say the majority of my stuff is family shows. Yeah, I, I do schools, a lot of schools. And then the summer months, it's all libraries. And then I still do a handful of birthday parties. I probably do mm -hmm. you know, probably 75 birthdays a year because the money's just too good to not do sometimes. But yeah, so those are the, then I do, I, I still 
do corporate. I think when you're as a family show performer, if you can do the adult show market and the kid show market, it's a nice niche to have because it's tough to see guys who do just adult shows try to go backwards and do kid shows. It's kind of tough for them. So I, I, I think I did pretty good doing the kid shows and then getting myself into the adult market. So I still do corporate work. Like I just did a Microsoft trade show last week. So I can still do both worlds, but most of my work is family shows, school shows, libraries. Right. And not everybody can do that, by the way. Right. And I, and I, I'm, I, I'm blessed. I feel that's pretty cool that I, like I'm saying, I, I don't see a lot of guys that can go backwards. If you start off doing corporate yeah. and you try to go back, if the, if the market's slow and go do a kid show, I think it's hard to pick up. So. Yeah. I, I think I'm, what I'm saying is not everybody has the skill to do both. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I tell you, I don't, I, but I don't think my kid show is one that's a, a screamer type show. Like I don't think the, I don't, I, I re, when I write a kid show for, let's say a library or a school, I really want the adults to really, especially at libraries, I want the moms that are there and the, and the dads are there to really enjoy the show. So I kind of write the show starting with them in mind first and then the kids come second. Uh, hmm. And often you, you get the, I know you hear those comments all the time. They go, I think I enjoyed it more than the kids did. And I used yeah. to think, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But now I think it's, it's really a good thing because that's how I get my corporate work is that if I'm seen at a birthday party or maybe a family night show at a school show, the adults will get a kick out of it and they go, that would be funny at the, you know, at Tom's company function, you know, right. this in December. So, well, not only that, but you're not selling to the kids, you know, you're selling to their parents. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So even when you're selling another birthday party or a school, even if it's another family event, uh, right. you know, you're selling to the parents. Right. So you, yeah. You got to please I want them. The, I want the family to be happy, you know, and I get fixated on the adults in my show sometimes. I'll sit there and see a mom on a phone and I get fixated on that one person. And I, I just, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I want them to be involved in my show so bad. And so I don't want to be that guy where I'm just a babysitter at any kind of party. I want to be, you know, I want them to really enjoy the show because it's for everybody. And so that's my, my ultimate goal shows is to make them really enjoy the show and not just be a, a kid show that just for the kids. Oh yeah. In fact, one of the, one of the techniques that I've used over the years, and I don't know if it's because I'm older than the parents now or what, but uh, <laughs> some of the music that I use during the show is older music that the parents would recognize. So oh my God, we're on the same, we do the same thing. Oh, you do the same thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it draws them in, right? Even though yes. it's good and it's hip and it's fun music. So the kids love it, but I'll the have parents, parents recognize it. They'll say, do you have that music on any kind of soundtrack? Because it, <laughs> it, I may have some 80s cuts, maybe some 90s in there. You know, I mean, you know, you just never know. So yeah, it's definitely, a, the, you know, the funny thing is I'll play a song that is, I, I don't know what comes to mind right now, but it'll be a song uh, that, that's so old that I remember where it's from, but the kid goes, Oh, that's from uh, you know, Harry Potter. That's from some other movie that, that's been oh, replayed yeah. on. And so that I'm like, no, that's actually from Ferris Bueller. Yeah. So. <laughs> I play uh, spice girls in my show still to this day, to this day. Look at that. Yeah. And, and about three or four years ago, there was a target commercial that used it. Ah, uh, see. So, so all the kids are going, Oh, using that music from the target commercial. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. But yeah. People love it. Now, what what do you find is the difference between a library show, a school show, you know, family fun night, just for fun show? Ah, uh, gosh. Well, the library show that I'm, I've been doing libraries for this is like my twenty second year into the library market, and I know you guys. I think you guys have two themes, if I'm not mistaken, in California, right? Most of the time, yeah. Yeah. So in Georgia, it's just one. Uh, it's just one theme, and we know typically two and three years ahead of time what our themes are, but. I think what's kept me in the business of the libraries is just writing that theme show every year and changing mm. it up a bit uh, and really making it theme for them. So I think the library show is still fun. It, it still should be a fun show, but it has some reading aspects to it to get the kids excited for reading sure. where uh, my school show, same thing. I go in with a, you know, a, a, an assembly where I've got three bullets that I want to get covered in my assembly. And then at nighttime, it's just merely a fun show to get everybody out as a family, as a school as a whole, and, uh, you know, have a good time. So it's, there's nothing educational. It's just a fun show. And then the birthday party show is, is really is just making the birthday kid the star of the show. So, you know, those are the three different avenues that I got on the, on the, the kid show markets as far as what I'm doing in those markets. Yeah. And, and back to the school show for a second. I love the idea of the three bullet points because a lot of people do five or six and kids don't remember those. You know, three right. is perfect. I, I'm, st I'm still convinced as in a, an assembly. So as we do assemblies going in there, I don't think in 45 minutes we're going to teach these kids things that they don't already have, they've already been taught by their teachers. So I like to go in there and reinforce things that the teachers that have already taught them. They may learn something, maybe a takeaway, but I think if we go in there thinking we're going to change, just give them the 45 minutes of learning stuff, I think we're fooling ourselves. Yeah. I think we're just giving them a refresher course on things they've already learned 
uh, that, that the teachers have taught them and to give them, maybe give them something they can, they can leave off of, maybe a highlight or something. So Right, and maybe some visual cues for the teachers to use later. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, and yeah. keeping, I, I noticed there was somebody that wrote on a, one of the, the Facebook groups asking, how can he get into school shows real quick? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I don't know, school shows, I, people that want to get in trade, you know, you notice there's a reason why guys don't do trade shows because trade show is a, is a tough industry to get in. And it's also a hard business. I think the same is true with school shows. I think it's a, it's a tough industry. It's a tough one to get into and to keep your foothold in it. Uh, you know, because it's forever changing, I think, the school assemblies are. Yeah, uh, they are. You know, not only is the person that books you typically changes every year because it used to be principals, but now that principal doesn't book anything. Now it's the music teacher. It's the, you know, the, the PE coach. It's, it's so many different people booking the shows now. Or it's, the, it's the mom who won't be there next year. So you're, you're always re reinventing yourself to the next person. Right here in California, it's mainly PTA moms. Occasionally you get the principal and the teacher, but most yeah. of the time it's PTA moms. Exactly. Yeah. And the person who's in charge of programs or the PTA president changes every two years. Yeah. It's, it's maddening, you know, it's uh, cause you, you think you've got to, and there's, there are those, there are, there are those schools that you've got a good relationship with, with the principal, with the, you know, the administration that, that books you year after year. But yeah, I would say for the majority, you're having to re re, uh, you know, introduce yourself to the new person coming in. Yeah. Just, just this morning, or it was actually last night. I got an email. I got back. I went and saw the voice. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It was really, really fun. So I get home last night and I had two shows scheduled for this morning. So I get an email last night saying, Oh, I need to confirm that you're going to be here tomorrow. And I said, well, you know, I have my computer automatically set to confirm twice before I go there. And she says, oh, oh, well, the person you've been talking to is no longer here. Uh, <laughs> so the principal emailed me and I emailed him back. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow, such and such a time, whatever. Uh, so it turns out, sure enough, and this happens quite often, is that the PTA mom is no longer part of the sure. PTA. Sure. So someone has had to pick up the slack. I don't know if you do this, but on, on the school contracts that I send out, I, I send it to that person, typically the mom or dad that's booking me. Yeah. And then I always try to get the principal's email address and send them a copy uh, right. as well. That way there's more than one person channeled in there because likelihood that mom is not going to be there is likely, but the principal probably is going to be there. So if I can get them at least looped into the email to, so they're on the same page, yeah. I think it's a good thing. So no, that's a great idea. Uh, so now let's, uh, you know what, let's, let's do some fan questions. You want some fan, fan questions, Ken? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do some fan questions. Oh, Annie Banani. Oh, I love her. <laughs> she says, I love Ken Scott. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we've heard, we met uh, Annie and Buster at a Cadabra uh, years ago in Tennessee. And that's kind of how we became really good friends. And then we obviously did CACs out in California, mm -hmm. but I just love both of them. And, and she's just, I just love listening to her speak and, and see what she's doing with her, her, her career. She's, really she's very neat. neat. And there is an interview with her on the Variety Artist podcast. There you go. I don't know what number it is, but just, just type in Annie Banani. You'll there you her. go. Okay. So that was her question. I love Ken Scott. That was it. Perfect. Done. <laughs> All that right. was a tough one. Giuseppe Riano, who I know you know, also known as Joe Self, says, I love him. Says Annie Banani and I love Ken Scott. <laughs> <laughs> do, you feel the, do you feel there's like this, some... We have love. There's synergy there. We all love each other. <laughs> okay. Now I'll get into some real questions. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Axtell of Axtell Expression asks. I love him. Oh, you know, everybody loves everybody. Um, <laughs> he asks, how has Croco helped your career? Uh, nice shameless plug there, Steve. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you know, all kidding aside, that came about. Wait, wait, before, before you get into that, who, who is Croco for people who don't know? Croco, yeah, Croco is a, a, a puppet that I bought from Axtell. He's a crocodile puppet. I don't do uh, ventriloquists. I don't, uh, and what happened was it was like 19 years ago when Georgia, for the, for the themes and libraries, it was Georgia had their own theme. It wasn't like 42 states on the same page. It was like we had our own little theme. Mm -hmm. And I think the artwork, if I recall, was a a gator carrying a suitcase, like it was a traveling type theme. And so I said, I got to get some kind of, you know, alligator so I could put my show this year. Cause mm -hmm. Mark Daniel was using uh, puppets. And I went, I, I can see the, the strength of having a puppet, mm -hmm. even though I'm not a ventriloquist. So I, I reached out to Axtell then and I got uh, the crocodile puppet and put him in the show. And it was supposed to be a one, a one of like a one season. Mm -hmm. And he became a huge hit. 
it got to the point after two or three years, a librarian's requesting just the puppet and not me. Uh, <laughs> but and still to this day, I don't do vent. I, you know, Croco doesn't talk, but uh, I would say I become really good at handling Croco as far as I can take him into a school and a fifth grader is not going to sit there and go, he's a puppet. He's a puppet. Yeah. You know, I, at the end of the routine, I think they really think he's alive. Oh, uh, it, it's just something about, what I've learned over the years from watching guys, but I don't do vent. So, uh, so Croco, I would say to answer Steve's question, yeah. what has he done for me? He's booked me a lot of shows and, you know, after shows to this day, me and Croco go in front of the backdrop and get pictures with all the, the kids after the shows at library. So it's, yeah, Croco's huge. Croco makes a great photo op. <laughs> yeah. Well, that one picture that you used of me is by Tom, uh, Tom Vorgeron and Michael Messing, who I think you did a thing with them. Oh yeah. Uh, Tom always reminds me that he's in that shot with me because he's the one holding Croco and he got edited out of the shot. Oh, is he really? But that is my, it's one of my favorite shots. It just captures everything about, I think my character, my style, and it, it absolutely, you know, captures everything about Croco. Yeah. Well, the cool thing about having a puppet in your shot is that as good looking as you are, you are not green. <laughs> <laughs> he is very colorful. But yeah, but he, yeah, to answer Axtell's story, I mean, question it, he's brought a lot to me he's he's done really well for me so and you know I, it's funny because some people will see me at schools and libraries and they'll ask me hey is Croco going to be in your show at the birthday party and he's not he you know he's merely just for the schools and libraries so yeah it's, okay. i haven't taken him into the birthdays yet all right well that that kind of brings us into michael worsham's uh, uh question he's a terrific magician out of maryland he asks kind of what we're talking about since you're not a ventriloquist how do you introduce your puppet to the audience yeah, so, uh, God, there's a, a fun, Kimmo, you know, do you know John Kimmo, Kimmins? Yeah, from, uh, the, I know who he is. So, again, became friends with him uh, and Gary Dunn, all those guys from the UK, and he does vent, and he has a thing where, because uh, I, think, I think I'm pretty good with, with sound and sound effects using my remote control stuff. I've been using it since the late 90s, and uh, I love to talk about that, but... Yeah, in fact, that, that's the next question okay, good, that good. Michael has. So right. we'll, we will talk, we'll get into that. So Kimmo has a thing where he talks about his puppet and he says, I'm about to bring out my friend. And then all of a sudden you hear a door knocking. And he kind of picks behind the creek. Hey, I'm giving you an introduction. So he's kind of talking to the puppet and the puppet hasn't even came out yet. And then mm -hmm. he goes back out and you hear knock, knock at the door again. And you go back like you're getting frustrated. You go, hey, I'm introducing you. Do not knock on the door. If you knock on the door again, you're not coming out. Do not knock on that door again. And then you hear a doorbell. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so you've kind of given the puppet character and they haven't even seen the puppet yet. Now, when I introduce Croco, I tell the kids straight up front that he's just a puppet. He's not real. And that kind of defuses the kids going, You're, it's just you working him because I've already told them that he's not real, that he's just a puppet. So those, those older kids who think they know everything, I've already told them what they're going to say to me. So I've kind of taken that off the table. So by the time he comes out and gets into his antics, they've already established that he's not real but by the end he's totally real to them <laughs> yeah so that's kind of how I, I introduce him and then uh like i said i don't do vet but yeah he's just he has a lot of antics that he does now are you, are you talking for him oh, I'm, no 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 you're not I, i'm just it, it's no talking at all like he'll just he'll he'll do actions like uh like i'm re if i'm doing stories from uh like this year we did something for the for the uh the, the moon landing and we made an american flag appear so he had three scarves, red, white, and blue, and he was pretend to juggle these scarves. And he obviously a puppet's not going to juggle them. And I go, don't blink, you're going to miss this. Uh, and he, I got him in his hand like he's going to juggle them. He's looking around. And then I'll point to the back, go, hey, come on in. And everyone turns their head backwards. And I go, oh, you just missed it. He just did it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, uh, and then that, those three handkerchiefs get turned into an American flag. And he's holding one corner with his mouth, and I'm holding the other corner. So oh, that's cool. he's getting involved by holding props, bringing props out, hit me in the head with a pencil or something. And so, but at the end, I think in their minds, he did talk. I think if you ask any kids, he talked. Interesting. Crocker never talks, but you'll swear that the kids say he talked. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So let's talk about those technical things. Uh, Michael Warsham asks uh, also, what are the sources for the sound effects used in your puppet act, and technically, how do you make them all work, Mr. Remote Control? Yeah, so uh, let's start with the remote control first, and then bring it back to the sound stuff. I Back in 97, I believe it was, we have a convention here in Atlanta, shameless plug for my convention, Atlanta Harvest of Magic. When mm -hmm. I was, I used to attend as a, a kid, uh, we had Carrie Pollock there, 
And Carrie Pollock had a thing called the show tech. I remember that. And it was, do you remember this? And it started out as, I believe, a cassette. he made it as a cassette. And then it went to a, yeah. maybe, a, then it, the one I bought it, it was a mini disc player. But he would touch his ankles with his legs. His ankles would come together and his music would just fire off, like different sound effects. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that, is the, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I remember I had gotten married like in 93. And I remember saying something to my wife, like, um, I, I want to get the sound system, but it's $1,800. And I remember her flipping out because it yeah. was $1,800 back like in 96, 97. And I remember buying that. And to this day, it was the single best in, investment I ever made uh, in my career was buying that sound machine from him, even at, at, back in those days. Now, it's mm. obviously changed since then. There's so many different players you can use. Currently, I'm using a thing called a Q command, uh, yeah. which he's no longer making anymore. Uh, so now I'm kind of easing into the thing called the audio ape, which a lot of guys are using now. Yeah. So I'm kind of getting myself used to the audio ape, but, uh, you know, I just think adding the music to you, the shows or the sound effects, it just, there's a whole other element to a show when you add those things, you know, when you've got the ankle switch and that's, that's the big reason why I've added the ankles is because I get, you know, hand tied with Croco. Croco's on one hand, I've got my a prop on one hand and I need to make a sound effect. Well, back in the day I would have to, cue this up somehow and make a five second delay, hit the remote, count five seconds out to make it all work. Now I can just hit my ankles and make everything work. And it sounds like it's all, you know, seamlessly put together. But, nice. in, you know, I, I think that there's a, a neat story where I, I did a show. There's a, a very famous country singer named Zach Brown, uh, yeah. who lives not too far from where I live. And he brought his family to see my library show two years ago. And I'm like, wow, there's Zach Brown in my audience. I was a little freaked out. Mm-hmm. And he, I can see him waiting around and he's got like three or four kids. And he says, man, I really enjoyed the show. I'm Zach Brown. He goes, yeah, I know who you are. He says, I got to ask you, he goes, how do you control your music? <laughs> and I thought that is the coolest thing. He just got finished playing Fenway Park for 50,000 people. And I said, you just got playing for Fenway Park. He goes, yeah, but I got 45 guys running my sound. <laughs> you got you. Yeah. And I told him, I go, well, it's all right there. It's in this pocket. I got these remotes on. He goes, man, that is the coolest thing. Oh yeah. And you know, and then to the, you know, you go to shows and there'll be parents that see you at shows. Uh, Cause I do the sound effects and music at birthday parties. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll have parents go, how do you do your music? And I go, it's just well timed out. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't want to tell them I got these remotes everywhere, but although it is kind of neat to tell people, oh, I got this remote here. I got a remote here. Got a remote there. So, you know, it just, there's so many, it, it just adds so many different elements to a show that, that guys aren't using when you add a little bit of music in the background for something just to create a little, piece of uh, absolutely you know, atmosphere. absolutely it makes the show look bigger too it does 100 percent. yeah you have you have backdrops or side banners and mm-hmm. and then you have your table and then you have yourself and the, then the audio it makes it look like a show yeah it totally does there was it, in fact on a birthday parties years ago i talk about this on one of my dvds that where i would go and i would start touching things around the, the living room of a, a person's house and the music would start and stop and then i started Something happened where I was blowing a balloon up and I used a balloon pump and the balloon pump fell. And as I went to go get my balloon pump off the ground, my shoulder hit the sign on my front table, which says Ken Scott. And as I did that, my hip hit the remote in my pocket, which caused the music to stop. As Mm -hmm. all three of these things happened, the kids thought that was the funniest thing that the balloon pump fell. I picked it up, sign fell, music stopped. And I went, oh. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started pressing my sign on my on my table just hit my remote, but not, they didn't know I was doing it. And the music would start and stop. And then I would press the touch the, the birthday kid's finger. And then he would touch the sign and the music would stop. Soon I realized that the kids that I would, the other kids that I would pick during the show, they'd come up and I would see them secretly pressing my sign. And, <laughs> they could do it. and then I would go, ah, it only works at your birthday party. Yeah. But then I, I would, st- and I still do evaluations. Like I'll send a mom a little evaluation sheet. And, forever I was getting these like we love the touch game and I didn't quite know what they were talking about this touch game because it was more of a throwaway bit and they were talking about me doing this thing where the music started and stopped they thought that was just the coolest thing you just never know what what might be an accident turns into something that you know is, is a pretty big bit in your show yeah and the, the cool thing about that too is it's yours yeah totally yeah, yeah because it came about accidentally yeah. it's yours Although I saw you do that at a, uh, at a seminar at CAX and I'll probably be using it in my show. Quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it works, it works. 
it may be yours in Georgia, but it'll be mine in Southern California. Take it. I say run with it. You know, if it works, it works. <laughs> but it's, in, as far as I get my, my sound, I'm like you. I, I, we talked about this. I like to play music that the parents are going to enjoy too. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and in that, you're going to get a lot of people go, what about ASCAP? What about that stuff? And that's a whole topic in itself that I don't think we should get into right now. But, yeah. uh, but sound effects and stuff, I get sound effects off um, sounddogs.com. Okay. Uh, I think there's one called um, uh, audiostore.com, audioblocks.com, I think it's called. But mm-hmm. there's several sites that you can buy these from, but sound dogs is where I get most of them. And you're going to pay, depends how you, they'll ask you how you're going to use it. Are you going to use it for public performance? Or are you going to use it for recording? Then you pay different, you know, and how long the cut is of, of sound effect. But, you know, I, I just like using different sound effects. So that's where I'll get most of them is sounddogs.com. Oh, I found a place where you can use this audio for free and you can't always find exactly what you want, but sometimes they have a lot of cool stuff. It's called free sound. Okay. Uh, freesound.org. So go to freesound.org and they have a little search engine in there. You can search, you know, sawing sound or Christmas music or okay. whatever it is. And what it is, it's a resource where people put up their own sounds. They get in their own studio, put up their own sounds. It's a way for them to get known, I guess. Sound dogs. And then the other one I use is called audioblocks.com. And on that one, I've got, I actually pay a membership. I think I pay like 60 bucks a year for it. It's unlimited downloads. Okay. And where the, the sound dogs, sometimes those cuts on the sound dogs can be a little more expensive. And I think that's why I switched over to audio blocks, but now you're telling me something for free. I like that even better. So, but I, I will tell you the selection is, isn't probably as good as what you're used to. How about factor something John just made up? Does that sound like fun? Do it. All right. We do have some more fan questions, but I'm going to break it up this time. We're doing it a little right. differently. Is it fat? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. All right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a headline. You're going to tell me if it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Okay, go ahead. All right, first headline. During a show, a kid volunteer vomited all over Ken's magic table. Oh, I have to say that is probably definitely true. Okay, tell me about yeah. that. Well, I think we've all had these. You know, you know, I, there was. I remember in a library show this past year. I could, you know, we've all had the kids pee, and I looked down, and there this year, I said, and sure enough, this kid had peed, and I never like to make any kind of big deal about it because who, you know, you don't want to embarrass a kid. Yeah. But I, I was telling some of our friends, uh, I said, you know, your show is good when they leave a P mark on the floor, you know, your show where it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's kind of the, the mark. So long as there's no, there's no number two, but in that particular case, it was a birthday show and I kept watching the kid and he just kept looking like he didn't look good, but yet he was still on board because I use the birthday child a lot in the show, almost to the fact that I'll do a trick. He'll sit down and the moment that his bottom sit touches the floor, I go, I need uh, Jordan again, and I'll bring the same you know, the birthday child right back up again. And I'll do this like seven times back to back to back, and the kids are getting so frustrated because I keep using the birthday child. But it's a, it's a total pull for me to go, but I'll come to your birthday party. Yes, of course. So, and I kept seeing this kid. This kid almost started looking gray. And at that moment, I, it was, it's like the, the, the John F. Kennedy moment where you – I remember Seinfeld when they – you know, you can see the, the shooting in Dallas. They, you've seen that in different documentaries, like in slow motion. Yeah. Well, I visualized the same thing with this kid, the way he was about to vomit. <laughs> I looked and he was about, and I moved my table with my hand. Now, again, this is all slow motion in my mind. Like, oh no. I pushed my table and he projectiles his vomit like a rainbow. And instead of hitting the top of my table, because now I've moved it, it hits the top and goes down the entire front. Just like a, a, you know, a, like a waterfall of, of complete puke. And I remember the front row looking at them, they're going, oh, and then the girl, <laughs> one girl started, she started to get sick from the smell. Oh. And it, it was just a nightmare. And we're like, that had to be like in May because I remember carrying my table and I could not get that smell out of that table for two months. Uh. I tried washing it, shampooing it. And eventually I think I trashed the table because I could not get the smell out. So. Uh, yeah, that was, 
But I know we all have those horror stories. It happens when kids done different things. But yeah, I, I'm really lucky. I've never had anybody throw up on oh, stage. Oh God, well, I'm gonna make sure that happens to you. Yeah, in the audience many times, but but not oh, you know. God, <laughs> my act is that good. <laughs> yeah, my act was so bad they get sick <laughs> during the show. <laughs> All right, next next headline, and it kind of relates to what we were just talking about. Ken has seen five different kids in five different shows pee their pants. That is fake. Okay, False. Yeah. <laughs> I made that up, but that's got to be kind of true. Kind of true, for sure. I, I may have peed myself. <laughs> I know that I... Yeah, I don't. We can we can't talk about this, but there's. I know we've all got some different pee stories and crap oh, stories. Yeah. I'm sure. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I've had that happen a, a number of times in the audience, <laughs> and and I'll look out in the audience. All all of a sudden, in fact, once but once I'm remember, remembering in my head, all of a sudden, all the kids kind of scurry in this one little area. Yeah, I'm wondering yeah. what's going on over there. And so, sure enough, the show ends, and and I go over there, and I notice that the the custodians putting sawdust down. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. I've seen that happen a lot at yeah. schools. And it's funny that kids don't even blink. They're like, ah, oh, he's puking. Keep watching the show. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Next headline. During a school show many years ago, Ken saw an attractive teacher. Two years later, they were married. Mm. I got to an answer. Are you answering that? <laughs> no, you're answering that. I, I don't know. Oh, I thought you have to answer it. No, you have to answer it. What do you think? I think it's probably true, but I don't know. No, that's a fake one. No, that's a fake one? <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good. I think that's my, isn't that our, our dreams? We'd meet a teacher at a show. <laughs> that is a good one. I have, and I won't mention any names, but I have a friend here in Southern California who did end up marrying a librarian. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. No. Uh, my <laughs> wife, uh, we met, we actually went to school and high school together, but we didn't know each other. She was two years older than me. We met years later after I graduated and she had already graduated. She was working for the phone company. Later, when the phone company got bought out by AT&T, she didn't want to move. We didn't want to move to, to St. Louis where her job was being moved to. So she decided at age 40 to become a nurse. So she went to school at mm -hmm. a very late age to become a nurse. And mm -hmm. it was funny because as she's in college, there's kids that are 20, half her age, thinking that she's the teacher and she's there as a student. So, <laughs> so, this, so, so now she is, uh, she is a RN and works in surgery at a Cancer Center of America here where oh. we live in Atlanta. Thank God she works because she's our insurance. I mean, she's the one that has our health insurance for us. Mm. Yeah. It's all, you know, when you have it, you're self-employed, it's always, the insurance is a tough beast and she, she gets the insurance for our family. We've got three girls, so we have to, Insurance. I remember when we, when we, when I was paying insurance when she did not have a job when she was going to school, it was tough for a family of five. It was uh, very expensive. All right, next one, last one. Ken is currently the vice president for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. That is true. That is true. See, that's something I didn't know. Yeah, I uh, got asked to be a part of uh, the IBM. In Atlanta, I grew up in the IBM as a junior member and I, have, I was very lucky to be surrounded by a lot of really great magicians in Atlanta back when I was 11, 12 years old, like J.C. Doty and Dan Garrett and David Ginn. And, you know, it was a, a pretty vast performing guys here in Atlanta. And uh, I just grew up watching them and the IBM was always a big part of my, uh, you know, I, I remember those days when my mom would literally take me there and drop me off before cell phones and, and she'd go wait around the corner for me while I went to this meeting. So uh, when it came around, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. And then Michael Finney had asked me when he, he was present last year, he asked me if I would come on board and be a part of the board. And I went, you know, I'll do it. And then mm -hmm. someone said, Hey, would you mind helping us run the convention? And I went, Oh, I said, now we're, I got to do the board and run a convention because I've got my own convention. I don't want to want to run another one. So I did. And so I ran my first IBM last year, which was in Scottsdale. And they said, well, what about going up and, and being vice president, which the next thing is president-elect and the next one is president. So uh, now I'm, I'm the sitting vice president. Next year, I'll be president-elect. And then the, the year following, if I'm voted, I'll be president of IBM. Wow. So what are the dudes? Wait, hold on. My, my blind dog just came in. Okay. Hey, hey buddy. 
Get him in. My blind dog. My my dog has diabetes and he's blind. Oh. And so he comes home. He's like, daddy, daddy, daddy. Yay. <laughs> uh, what are your functions as the vice president of the Brotherhood of Magicians? Well, I think the vice president more is, is a job just to obviously support the, what the president is doing at this point, which is a young guy from uh, Canada, Alexander. He's, uh, yeah. he's the, currently the president. But I, I think in whole, it's just trying to get the IBM. You know, I remember going to a convention when I was a kid, the IBM convention. It was easily 1,000, 1,200 people. You know, now it's, you know, the, the organizations are kind of dying off, which is kind of sad. I think there's a place for them. We still need them. But it's just about getting the youth involved, and it's tough getting the youth involved because they're so YouTube. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a, a big thing with our, the youth today is that they get stuck on their phones, and they, they can't look up, and they can't hold that conversation. And I think sometimes these kids can do these crazy knuckle-busting performances with cards and coins, but yet put them in front of a, a, you know, an audience, and they just they don't have it. So uh, I think these conventions are great. I think conventions, you can't – there's something you can't learn watching YouTube where you can go to a convention and sit – at the feet of a, a person that's been around for years and learned the history and learned stories, you know, just trying to get the IBM back up and, and make it a organization where we can get a lot of people at the conventions and being a part members of the, you know, that the, the, the IBM is what I'm trying to go for. So. Yeah. I wonder too, if part of it's technology, cause nowadays, I mean, you and I are talking right now on zoom yeah. I'm in Southern California and you're, in, you're in Georgia. Yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, thousands of miles apart talking. I wonder if, if the younger generation now looks at Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, all of those things and says, well, gee, I don't need to go to a convention because I can just talk to my friend all the way across the country with some sort of media. There, you know, there's totally, is. I mean, these kind of conversations that you're having that you and I are having right now were, you know, you would have these back in the day and you would be at a convention. That's where you would hear these things. So yeah, I think that Definitely the technology has changed. And I think the conventions are especially like the IBM. We just got to learn a way to, you know, adapt. And then when they're older generation of uh, members, they have to learn to adapt to the new stuff that's coming out too. A lot of these people don't want to get a, a PDF of the linking ring. And maybe that might be a better way to save money. I'm just throwing that out there. But, you know, sure. you, there's just, so yeah, my wife goes, why are you doing this? So uh, why am I doing the IBM stuff? I guess because I really just care about the IBM and I do love magic. I really, it's a passion for me. It's more than a, you know, it's a job, but it's still a passion. I love it. I want to see IBM thrive and, and make it a great organization, which it, which it is and always will be, I think. I'm glad people like you are around. I'm going to pay a ton of money for it. <laughs> and, and how much would that be? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I got to figure. <laughs> <laughs> that was Back Ooh. or Something John Just Made Up. Ah. All right, we're going to go back to some library talk. How about that? Sure. Yeah. I have some more fan questions. We kind of broke that up. But Conrad Cologne, another excellent magician out of New Jersey, uh -huh. he says, this is a big, wide question. Can you walk us through your process of creating a new themed show? And in parentheses, he wrote, I know this could be a whole podcast on its own. Boy, he's right. He's right about yeah. that. Um, you know, just uh, I could talk. We can just go briefly on it. But like I said, now that we, we know the themes two, three years out in advance, you can already start thinking about things in your mind, how I want to start structuring a show. Again, I think I told you about that early on that in my shows, I, I try to write a show every year where it's a new logo, new look, new design, because the librarians can't go. It's the same show every year. There's a lot of guys that go out and do the same show every year mm -hmm. and they may not get booked. I mean, it's become an a, a ongoing joke with me and some librarians that I the librarians want the same time, same date every year. And it's become what I call timeshare because they want that same date. So, but I think part of that that they want is that I, I hope that I'm doing a really great show for them. They're, I'm getting people into the libraries, but the show changes every year. As far as the structure of it, Croco's in the show. He may be doing a different book, read a different book. He may be a different costume he's wearing, but there's some structure that stays in the show every year. But as far as the routines, I may pull something I did seven years ago and bring it back in the show and rewrite the script. You know, mm -hmm. like when I knew this year was space for us, right. I knew that two years ago, well, I had stuff in my mind two years ago that I was thinking about just like the upcoming year we got in 2020 is about uh, theater. Fairy tales is what ours is. And so I've already, you know, had ideas that I did years ago and we had a kind of a, you know, a fairy tale theme back eight years ago. I can pull from that. So just changing it up and giving it a different look, giving it a, you know, paint it a little differently, gives it a different feel for them too. And then just rewriting the script helps me out on that. 
All right. Well, I, I guess that brings us to, to Brett's uh, question. Brett Bullich, a.k.a. Bretso the Great, a Southern California oh, yeah. magician. He even asked something you just mentioned. Is your library show scripted word for word or is it in segments for each trick? I would say it's more in segments. I'll write it out. Uh, you know, obviously the routine kind of word for word. As far as practicing it, I, I like scripts, but I'm never one of those guys who like to go in and turn the switch on and begin the script. Mm -hmm. Because in a kid's show, you just can't do it because you got to zig and zag at a kid's show, all right? You know, with any kids in the audience. And it, I've seen guys who are totally script driven who can't handle that one kid that's make, doing something because it's not in the script and you, you can't, you, it's tough for them to get to that position. So I have a loose, I should say loose script, and then I'm able to zig and zag and go where I need to go, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. Um, and, and if it was scripted out, you would have never dropped your balloon pump and accidentally bumped the, your logo. As and... long as there's a, a, a loose base script where you know you want to hit some things on and you want to cover it, but I don't want to act like I'm just turning it on and go, uh, and then the switch is on, hey, I'm Ken Scott, welcome. I don't want to be that guy who's just totally reading the script. Although after you do 100 shows in two months, I often tell people when they come, you know, especially magicians who want to come see my show, I say, give me 10 shows. Yeah. Don't come until at least 10 shows because those first 10 shows, you know, I'm really just, I'm getting my, my bearing straight, like where the, my props are going, where things are going. And, you know, you can rehearse that in your mind. You can rehearse it into your, in your studios, but unless you're out there in front of the audience, you're not going to know this stuff. And then once I've done it that many times, yeah, it's kind of script driven then because now I've, I know what I'm going to say every show, but it took me 10 shows to get there. So it, it starts loosely baked script, loose baked script. Yeah, and at that point in time, after your 10 or 12 shows, you know the script so well when those things are thrown at you. Right. You can chuck and jive and tap dance a little bit. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, and then uh, when, once you haven't done that show, like I was pretty much off for August and some of September, I had to go back and rewatch my, my video just from the show I did this summer because mm -hmm. I'd forgotten a lot of it. I mean, you know, if I don't do it in, in a week or two, you kind of forget that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I had to go back and watch the video to f find out where I would, you know, my basically learn my script again. I, I do a different show. Uh, I'll do, I'll do my summer show for two months, just like you. Yeah. And then I'll go back to doing my school shows again. And my school shows are very, very specific. You know, they have yeah. very specific points that I hit. Yeah. And I remember my first couple of school shows, I basically almost forgot where I was because I hadn't done it in two months. Is it crazy? I mean, it's... Yeah. So it's, on the drive, so on the second day, I think on the drive there, I was going through my head, okay, what do I say here? How, what I, how do I hit that point? What do I do? See, I've got mine on my, uh, my phone. I got it uh, as an audio. And oh. so I'll put it on my, as I'm driving to my shows, I'll re I can hear the audio. I, I don't really need to hear it to see the show. I just need to hear the audio and figure out where I, my, where I'm at. And yeah. that's all, that's also goes back to about music. When I'm able to look down on my iPad and see my cues, it kind of mm. keeps me in order of my show so I can see what cues are there and what's next. It's almost like a cue sheet for me. That kind of keeps me in line as well. So if I haven't done a show in a while, I can look down and see, you know, what my, my next thing is. So that kind of helps me. All right. Doug Shear, you know, Doug, of course. Oh, I love Doug. Doug Shear of Shear Genius says, I know you kill it selling back of the room during your library shows. Can you give us your back of the room speech or any tips to get people to buy? Doug's spot on. And it, that could be a whole topic. Uh, I love back of the room because I think we all know that much money that can be made. I mm -hmm. think part of the back of the room sales has to go with the moms or the parents and the kids really loving you. Like you're really like a star, if that makes sense, but not an egotistical star. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I often hear guys talk about their shows and show business, and I think it's very important to know both of those. But I, I'm a big believer that you got to have the very best show, not just a, a half good show or a pretty good show would be a great marketer. I think that it's totally the, the comes first is that show and then become a marketer. Because I think once you've got the show and you're out there performing, they get so involved in you, the audience does, they get so locked into you because you're doing just a, you know, a really, you've involved them. You've, you brought them into your, in, into your show that I think they want a part of you. I think they want to be, they want to take souvenirs home because they mm -hmm. really, you endeared to them in a way in the show. What I, I don't really set up a magic shop because I don't want, and I've learned, especially at library shows and even at family shows. I think if I go over 20 bucks with parents, I'm starting to make them upset because they weren't prepared to come and spend money. So I've learned that my, my, price point is about $20 that I want to try to get from them. Mm -hmm. 
after that, I think you're starting to make them upset. So I typically sell three things. It's typically a DVD of my past show and then me teaching tricks. Uh, it's typically, I had a, a stuffed Croco that I had for years. I bought like 3,000 of these things and they were, couldn't keep them. But now, unfortunately, the company stopped making those. But I usually have something like that and then a custom magic set. So I've got three things that are, are customized to me or to the show. There's not just something that I uh, just found at Robbins. I'll make something that's neat to the show. And then it'll be like $10 for this, $10 for this, $10 for this. But if you buy them all today, you get them for 20 Okay. Uh, so they, they, they save money. And that way I'm not having to sit there and their answer is give me off, give me the package deal instead yeah, of going out, give me one of those, give me one of those. And the script is typically at my, it happens towards the end of my show. And if I'm doing like, let's say my fantasy magician routine or a mm -hmm. trick, I'll usually give one of the kids that I have a big part in the show, the magic kit and give them a big presentation of why I'm giving it to them. I'm going to pass it forward. I want to see them become a magician. And then remind them, go, hey, we also have, you know, then go into my little speech about how I have it. I don't do a big commercial. I don't think you need to. If you've done a good show, they want a part of you. They want to meet you after the show. And I tell them, hey, I've got this stuff over here. But if you just want to come see, meet me in Crocker, we'll be right over here. And it just takes a few of the families start buying. And then the other kids, obviously, they, they want it too. Got it. And then I, I take, you know, Square, uh, my credit card's right there. So I don't, I very rarely get cash anymore. It's always credit card. Nowadays. Nowadays. Yeah, right. So. Yep. To answer Duck's question, there's not a huge sales. I don't want to make a big pitch on it. And then I, I do ask permission at libraries. Some systems don't allow that, so you just don't do it. And it's not worth jeopardizing me losing the gig just for selling some items. Yeah, in fact, that was one of Annie Banani and Amy Bryant Pryor's question was, uh, do you know how do you get permission from the libraries or do they all give you permission? That was one of the questions. Yeah, so libraries, I know typically what, what systems I can do that in. And some library, like I'll go in these rural areas of Georgia and a librarian just go, hey, do me a favor, don't sell anything because these, some of these kids just don't have, they don't have the means to, to, to pay for it. And it's, that's fine, we'll, we'll, sure. we won't sell anything. Ironically though, when I do those kind of shows, it's, it's those rural areas where you think you're not gonna sell anything where I sell the most. <laughs> it's where I go to these big rich schools where I think I'm going to just kill it here and I'll, I'll sell, you know, 10 DVDs. But yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how it works out sometimes, but there are some shows where I, I'll go in at family night shows and at definitely schools I'll ask. And if there's any kind of, uh, it's almost like the Michael Martin negotiating higher fees. If I hear any kind of the money might be an issue, I'll, this might be a way that I can say, I also sell my, sure. my product and I can give you 10% after my shows. But then if, if they're not really asking for it, then I'll just say, hey, I also do a nice thing where I meet the kids after the show. I have my DVDs and Magic Kids. They go, oh, that would be great. So I kind of just zig and zag there as well, figure out where they are in that. So it sounds like the only time you negotiate uh, giving part of your back of the room sales back to the PTA or the library or whoever it is, is when there's a money issue. Right. And I typically don't do that. I won't do it with libraries because there's just not enough money. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not getting school assembly money at library shows, if that makes sense. So I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just assume not sell anything if they, if they're wanting to cut on it. Schools. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know that I can make, you know, sometimes $1,100, $1,500 in, in back of room sales. I don't mind giving them 10% if I'm, if that's the case. Sure. That makes sense. All right. Well, Doug has a follow-up question about your DVDs. He says uh, you produce DVDs, back of the room sales. Does anyone want a DVD anymore? Uh, that was, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's your game plan to keep selling back of the room with DVDs having gone out of favor, he says. Yeah. It's, it's a question that has become unanswered at this moment. I, I haven't sold the DVD the last two seasons. You just went with a different item because of that. I mean, people still have DVD players. And I, I tried one year just doing a link. It just didn't go over well yet. It wasn't. They weren't ready for that. I was going to give them a link that they went to Vimeo and they put a passcode in and watch it that way. But yeah. it just wasn't, uh, it, they, you know, they got to see the product up there in my hand, I think, to get it. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of like, I don't know if you remember, years and years ago, people used to sell encyclopedias. Yeah. And for those of you listening to this that don't know what a cycle encyclopedia is, it's a set of books that are, I don't know, what, 24 books, 28 books, something like that. Yeah. And each has all the information you could ever want about something. Uh, they sold great. Then someone came up with a DVD with all the encyclopedias and it didn't sell worth anything because yeah. it was a small little DVD, even though it had all the same information. That's a great uh, analogy. And I never yeah. realized that. 
yeah, it wasn't something that they could hold in their hand that, that had these volumes of information or appeared to have volumes of information, so it didn't sell. And that was the death of the encyclopedia. And, and then this thing called Google came along. I mean, my gosh, I mean. Yeah, and now you have a, <laughs> you have, yeah, and a cell phone, you have an encyclopedia, a group yeah. of encyclopedias in, your, in the palm of your hand. Uh, I, 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 I made a joke this past year at a library. There was a, I was in this area where I was performing, there was a encyclopedist to my left, and I, I made uh, a cell phone reappear in that general area. And I went, oh, look, it appeared in these encyclopedias. Kids, encyclopedias. It's these books that we used back in the 80s. <laughs> They're like, what? And the librarians go, you had to diss our encyclopedias. I go, there was so much <laughs> dust on those things. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, to answer Duck's question, I don't know. Uh, I think it's still unknown. And I would love to find out what, if guys or what other guys are doing. You know, it's funny because some of the, you go to these, these big concerts and I know like Jeff Dunham still sells his DVDs at, at his shows. Uh, mm. So I, they're, they're still selling. I just don't know if I don't, they are, they're faded off a little bit. I think with the, the, the with Netflix and uh, you know, Amazon prime, that kind of stuff. I think people are just so used to it being online now. I think they're just used to that. So. Yeah, I know when you buy a new magic trick nowadays, rarely, occasionally they come with a DVD, but usually they come with a link. Yeah. Yeah, you click the link and you watch the video. Yeah, I, just the other day, I went to Blockbuster Video and uh, I got a VHS and we're still- Wait, 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 you went where, what, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still doing VHSs. You know, I think about doing my music on reel to reel. It might be a little easier, you know? Which brings me to this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to music. I'm, we're jumping around here, but I do a thing where I have a, an eight track. And this is, and I forgot who gave me this bid. It might have been JC Doty, but it's an eight track. And it's got my name on it. And if I ever go do a show, let's say at a high school, and there's yeah. always young kids or high school kids who are the stage hands for you, who run on the spot for you. And, I, and they'll go, hi, Mr. Ken or Mr. Scott or whatever. I'm running your sound for you. Oh, perfect. I'll hand them the eight track and go, when they introduce me, play track <laughs> three and track seven, and that's it. And walk away. Oh, no. And they got this little eight track in their hand. Because, I mean, at that moment, I'm, I'm, a, I'm locked in. Just give me a hard line and I'm using my music. So it's just a funny <laughs> bit to use. So. That's great. Le- Levitt does a bit where in his show he goes, I've got my whole show on uh, scratch and sniff. You can sniff my whole show. And he's got the little scratch <laughs> and sniff cards. And he's got the little thing you used to look and the, what was it? The viewfinder where you click it and you see the little pictures inside oh, of yeah, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he goes, about. you can buy this and see my whole show. and. So he's got a lot of old bits, how he does his back of the room. I love watching Levent, how he does some of his old bits about, you can buy this whole thing on reel to reel. <laughs> <laughs> on your A-track thing, you should give him the A-track and then you should stick around with, with all your remotes all over your body. <laughs> yeah. And then when they hit, they hit like track number seven, you know, you hit your music. So they think that they're doing it for a while <laughs> oh. and then walk away and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I know you and I, we could talk for hours, but we just, we're on the same industry. We're the same stuff we do, but. Your style and my style are similar and we have similar venues, similar, uh, yeah, everything. It's, well, it's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah, I have lots of other questions, but you know what? You know, I, we'll save them for next time. We'll do a part two. But if, if I could do a shameless plug on my convention. I have, I have two shameless plugs for you. First, your convention. Go. Yeah, so I do a convention every other year here in Atlanta. And it's a very small convention. There's something to say about the big conventions like Magic Lives or the IBM kind of stuff there's something to say about small conventions. And I think my convention draws about 180 to 200 people. Mm -hmm. And you can really get to hang and jam with people, people you don't know, you get to become like a little family. So it's called Atlanta harvest of magic.com. I only do it every other year because I can't afford to do it every year. I make very little money at it, but it's just fun. I love hanging with magicians at these conventions. And Mm -hmm. it's fun to, it's fun putting conventions together because you get to see the little puzzle piece comes together at the end and see how it all comes together. But so it, it happens every year, usually at the end of September, 1st of October, it's going to take place next year in 2020, October 1st through 3rd. So it's mm-hmm. AtlantaHarvestOfMagic.com. Okay. So, uh, I would love people to come and be a part of this convention. It's a nice little Atlanta thing, tradition. That sounds like fun. I didn't even know about it. There you go. Oh, I meant to tell you, a few months ago, I put together my own Christmas show, a brand new Christmas show. Yeah. And the first thing I did when I put together that Christmas show is I go on KenScottProducts.com. I said, you know what? I need to take a look at, see what the different things that Ken offers are. So I bought, as you know, two of your products and I'm using them in my Christmas show this year. I think you bought, did you buy the elf hat thing? Did you? That what you I bought the elf hat thing and the growing frosty thing. Yeah. So I, I love, obviously I, I have, I'm big into Christmas. Uh, anybody that goes to my Facebook page, my personal page, 
I, I love Christmas. I start decorating, you know, we're taping this in November. I mean, October, I'll start decorating right after Thanksgiving because it takes me mm-hmm. a while to decorate my house. So I love Christmas. So I put out products. Now I'm one of those guys and there's a lot of guys that do this. I don't put products out unless it's been in my show, unless it's something I do. So if you see something on my site, know that it's been in my show or I'm doing it. So, uh, yeah, I've got several things on there. Ken Scott products.com and the growing, the uh, peering frosty out of the box that happened about seven years ago. And it's just, it's a great piece. I love that thing. And then the elf hat came from, from another bit that I did during a, the building theme for libraries. I did a hard hat routine uh, mm. that was a big success. And then I just took that idea and went to an elf hat to make it for my holiday show. So it was, uh, I had two things I used and that's how I was able to come up with elf hat. Those are great props and great Thanks. routines. I, I'm excited about you seeing what I've done with the, the different routines for the different props. It's, love it's pretty it. cool. Love it. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Uh, so what is the name of that, that uh, product URL again? It's kenscottproducts.com. Excellent. So take a look on there and uh, get some Ken Scott products. And know that this stuff, you know, it's me making it like my, my fantasy magician tuxedo routine that I sell. It's one of those things that if it's not, if it's not in stock, my stepmom makes those. And, 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 you know, I go to a tux shop, I buy tux shirts and jackets and it's not like I've got a hundred in stock. I may have one of this in stock at a time. We just don't, we may, you know, they're hard to make. So just know that a lot of the stuff that's in there is not, I make them by, I'm sitting there making this stuff. So we're not a big shop. It's me. It's me making this stuff. Typically, the, the Christmas stuff starts coming out like in August where I can start getting my supplies back in. So that's what we did. Excellent. KenScottProducts.com. All right, why don't you give me a recommended book and I'll get you out of here. I would say, man, Ken Weber. Ken Weber, Maxim Entertainment. I mean, are they, are they any better than that? His first one, you know, he's got a new book out, Maxim Entertainment. I just love Ken Weber. I love reading his books. If you get his books, it's something for everybody. If you're doing kid shows, if you're doing corporate stuff, if you're a minimalist, everything is in there. It's just a, it's almost like the Bible for, for guys performing part-time, full-time. He really gives you everything in there and gives you detail. So Maxim Entertainment is my favorite go-to books. Maximum Entertainment. Excellent. Ken Weber. Ken Weber. Ken, yep. like, like, like you, Ken. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Speaking of Ken's, thanks, Ken, for doing my show. It was awesome. John, it was great. I loved it, man. Thanks. It was great. Do you have some social media or something you'd like to plug before we go? Yeah, if you want to just, uh, I'm on, uh, obviously, Facebook and go to Ken Scott Magic on there. Uh, you can find me, my personal page, Ken Scott Weisenbaker, but if you don't, Ken Scott Magic is fine. Then I've got my Instagram, Ken Scott Magic. Ken Scott Magic is pretty much in all my social media stuff. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend to listen. You can reach me at my Facebook page. Just shoot me out a message. And while you're there, join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests, like my friend Ken Scott. And make sure to check out Ken's show notes page. This is great stuff. Thank you, man. Thank you, Ken. Thanks again for, uh, for taking a little bit of time. Appreciate it. Got it. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.